What's going on, guys, and welcome to episode 396 of Hashtag Ask GSM. Here today for Wednesday, June 30th, 2021. I am Graham GSM Matthews. Hope you guys are doing well. Crazy to think that today technically marks the first half of 2021 being over. Maybe not like days-wise. Maybe we reached like the, the halfway point a few weeks ago, I think I heard. But like months-wise, the first, as of like today or tomorrow or whatever, because today's, today's June 30th, today does, or tomorrow... The first six months of 2021 being over. That's fucking wild. I mean, for a year that's been so far, I would say, an improvement over 2020 in a lot of ways for a lot of people. You know, things are going back to normal, which is great to see. I was at a Northeast Wrestling show on Sunday, my first live indie show in almost a year and a half since maybe Evolve in February of 2021, like a week or two before the pandemic started, which was cool, but... Yeah, 2021's been a big year, a lot of fun year, you know, having a lot of fun this year, doing a lot of cool stuff, myself and a lot of other people, and we're already halfway through it. My phone just went off, I apologize, but uh, yeah, no, it's crazy to think that the year is halfway over, so let's try to enjoy it and not speed it up at all. I know there's a lot of cool stuff going on, and obviously, time does fly by when you're having fun, but still, let's try to slow down a little bit and enjoy the rest of uh, what 2021 has to offer. But speaking of which, a couple of things before we get started with your questions. Um, If you haven't already seen it, check out my exclusive interview right now with one half of the potentially next NXT Tag Team Champions, Tommaso Ciampa, former NXT Champion, WWE NXT Superstar. Uh, Tommaso was great. We chatted earlier in the week. I think we talked on Monday. Interview went up yesterday here in the channel, first thing Tuesday morning, and then went up an article form later on in the day on DailyDDT.com. So if you're not already subscribed for one thing, what the hell are you waiting for here to the channel? Because not only do you get these Q&A videos literally every single Wednesday, have not missed a Wednesday or not missed a week of hashtag in probably five years, well over five years. So if you want your questions answered, want more insight on certain things, you're going to want to check out the channel every Wednesday. But not only that, in addition to this and the WrestleRant Radio excerpts where we do previews and reviews and predictions and stuff like that. Uh, and SmackDown audio reviews on Saturdays. I break down Talking Smack, Raw Talk, Dark Side of the Ring. I just got done reviewing the uh, China documentary from a week or two ago. I just broke that down on Monday. I review Broken Skull Sessions, WWE 24s, I talk Chronicles, Untolds. I review literally everything I watch on Peacock. But in addition to all of that, you're getting those exclusive interviews every once in a while. We have a couple going up each week. You know, last week we had Frankie Monet and the wide receivers, uh, the wide receiver from the Packers, the Green Bay Packers, uh, Devontae Adams, which was not wrestling related whatsoever. But if you're a sports person, if you're a football fan, specifically a Packers fan, you're going to want to check it out. It was a really cool interview I did for Bleach Report and the opportunity just kind of presented itself. And um, I talked a little bit about it last week here on the show when I announced it on maybe that Wednesday or whatever, because I think it went up on Thursday. But yeah, no, it was, uh, no, maybe I didn't announce it, but either way, it, it, was, it was a lot of fun to do, and it was really cool, so uh, be sure to check that out when you get a chance. It's also up in article form, as I mentioned, over on BleachReport.com on the football section, the NFL section, so that happened, which was awesome. I talked to Frankie Monet last week. This week, we talked to Tommaso Ciampa. We got another interview for Bleach Report going up on Monday, so the audio will be up on that same day. Um, It is a Raw superstar, that's your hint, which is why it's going up on Monday. It's a Raw superstar, but who is the question? So keep an eye out for that, going up live Monday morning here on the channel in audio form, and another WWE superstar whose interview is going up, I'm hoping, in the next couple of days. I've already done the interview, I did it last week, it's just more a matter of like transcribing it, writing it up, and all that other stuff, so... Keep an eye out for that as well here on the channel in the dates to come. But you guys came here for the questions, and that's exactly what we're going to answer here in today's show. If you want me to answer your questions from Twitter, if you want to tweet me a question, you could do so at WrestleRant on the Twitter machine with the hashtag AskGSM. Find me on Facebook as well, facebook.com backslash gram.gsm.matthews. Drop a question on the post that I usually put up on Tuesday nights, if not on the wall itself. And last but certainly not least, drop your question down below in the comment section on this very video. I'll include your question in next week's edition. So let's get right into it, guys. No L from YouTube. Their first question was, do you think if Kofi Kingston wins at Money in the Bank, and the question said the Money in the Bank, but by that point, by the time they sent this in, it was already announced that he was going for the WWE title of the pay-per-view. So I assume... 
no means um, that they were referring to at Money in the Bank when they faced Bobby Lashley, when Kofi faces Lashley. Do you think if Kofi Kingston wins at Money in the Bank, do you see him joining MVP and slowly turning heel down the road? You know, as much as that idea intrigues me, and it looked like they were kind of going in that direction with the interactions between the two backstage and MVP blaming Woods for always taking the fall for Kofi, all this other stuff, as cool as that would be, the issue with it is that I don't think they would ever do it. In speaking to Biggie myself and in speaking to Kofi myself, it really honestly feels like New Day is never going to break up. We're almost seven years into the group at this point, which is unprecedented for almost any stable to consistently be on the show for seven years. The Usos have been a tag team for over a decade now in WWE, um, but a stable, like a, a, a three-man group on any television show, let alone WWE where they break people up left and right, is unprecedented. So I don't think that it's ever going to happen. I think we're well po- past the point of it ever happening. You know, I was pitching it a year or two ago. Oh, Kofi's champion. Maybe turn on Kofi and cost him the championship. It never happened. Woods turning on Kofi would be interesting. But like, you know, Kofi feuding with Woods with, with Woods as the heel. Because uh, Woods, although I like Woods a lot, I just don't think they see him as being on that level. Like Kofi would beat him on a episode of Raw and then it would be over. And then it would be back to uh, main event for Woods. And I'm not talking about the main event scene. I'm talking about the show. So Kofi turning heel would be interesting. Uh, I just don't see it happening. I don't. So I don't even think he's going to win at Money in the Bank. But even if he did, I just think he would be another babyface champion. And to be quite honest with you, they need more babyfaces on this show anyway. And SmackDown as well. They need more top-tier babyfaces. Is Kofi that guy long-term? No. Um, He's not exactly the beginning of his career. He's been here for over a decade been there, done that. He already had a six-month WWE title run. We need fresher faces in the main event scene. While Kofi is a fresh face, we need more newer faces as well beyond just Kofi. I don't think he's winning, nor do I think he's turning heel. There's a second question with the draft coming up. What NXT superstars should go to the SmackDown roster or the Raw roster? I'm almost positive I've answered this at least twice before in recent weeks. A lot of you guys are asking you know, who from NXT should be the next to be called up and whatever. And I'll keep this short and sweet for anyone who has ever, for for, the, for those of you who have heard my answers before when being asked this question, because I've definitely answered in recent weeks. But um, the first name that comes to mind is Bronson Reed. Not because I desperately want to see him in the main roster, because I think he's perfectly fine where he is right now in NXT. They just had him lose the North American Championship last night on the show. Like, unadvertised, too. They made him and Scott official for the show earlier on in the evening, the very beginning of the show, without even advertising it in advance. So that tells me that they're rushing Reed to the main roster. It could be next week. It could be next month. The draft reportedly isn't coming up until fucking August. So if they're waiting until the draft to call him up, why would you do it so soon? You know what I mean? Hey, maybe they'll give him one of the final spots on the SmackDown side of things for the Money in the Bank ladder match for the men. Maybe. You never know. But, like, if he was being called up in August, then I think it's only inevitable he was on main event last week. Then why would you have him lose the championship, like, literally immediately? They had him lose the championship less than a week after being on main event without even advertising it in advance. They just did him and Scott as an impromptu match on the show, and Scott won. So that tells me he's headed up really, really, really soon. They only do that type of shit when you're headed up really, really, really soon. So, Reed is definitely going up. Karrion Cross seems inevitable as well. He was on main event too. You know what? Maybe he does lose the NXT Championship to Johnny Gargano. That, that's, an, that's definitely a possibility. With how quickly Reed lost the North American Championship, it is absolutely possible that we get Cross and Gargano, not at the next TakeOver, but like on an upcoming episode of NXT, and he loses, the, he loses it to Gargano there. I don't know if they announced the match for next week. They may have. I don't think they did. Because we're getting Cole and O'Reilly next week. That's kind of like the crown jewel of that show. We're getting an NXT women's tag team title match. We're getting um, MSK, Tommaso Ciampa, and Timothy Thatcher for the NXT tag titles. So they already kind of have a stacked show. Um, And they have a few other matches as well, I believe, that I'm just not thinking of off the top of my head. But yeah, so I I don't know. I I just don't think that they're going to do it next week, but... That's not to say that they won't do the match in the near future, and that's not to say that Cross can't lose it on an upcoming episode of NXT 2 Gargano, which I'm not exactly sure if that excites me. Gargano's first run was very short. 
Um, he would be a babyface again this time, and I don't know. Gargano's been there for so long that it doesn't exactly excite me, the idea of him winning back the championship. But hey, maybe if they tell the right story, I'll get behind it. But either way, um, I see Cross going up sooner rather than later. You know, Io Shirai to me is a given. I feel like she's not going to win back the women's championship. I don't think they're winning the tag titles next week. Her and Zoe Stark. So I would um, probably call her on up to the SmackDown roster, in my opinion. Adam Cole would be great, but I assume he's beating Kyle O'Reilly next week, and he'll probably stick around in NXT for a little while. So the four names that come to mind are Cole, Shirai, Cross, who's not, like, needed, but I just get the sense he will get called up, and Bronson Reed. Um, I'm not sure who else you... Oh, Finn Balor, obviously, as well. Finn Balor, I'm not exactly sure if that's considered a call-up because he's been on the main roster before, but... I mean, I guess he could come back to NXT, but he, like, disappeared after losing the championship. He came back, went after the title, and he lost. So, like, what more can he do in NXT? Unless he has a farewell match and he loses that, too, which he obviously would. He, They probably should just wait to bring him back until... Like, as opposed to bringing him back to NXT, just wait until the main roster is ready to, you know, pencil him into the Raw roster or the SmackDown roster. So, Reed is absolutely going up. Finn Balor is absolutely going back. Io Shirai, um, who did I say? Adam Cole and Karrion Cross are my five picks. Not that I all want to see in the main roster, but those who are, who, who are I think are going up in the next couple of months, if not at the draft. Um, let's see. Next question from at Reborn again. John Ritland from the YouTube machine. Check out his show, Real Honesty with John Ritland. He does great work, as they always say. His first question was, um, the Kofi and MVP back and forth in the three-way main event were great examples of how good WWE can do on Raw. So why don't they do things like that more often and do less of the bad comedy? You know, that's the question. That's the question. Maybe it doesn't reflect well in the ratings. Like, you know, I honestly think as bad as Raw has been overall for like the last maybe year or so, there have been some good shows, specifically recently. I thought they had a very good wrestling-heavy show it wasn't Memorial Day. I think it was the week before Memorial Day. Where like they had Riddle and Woods was a fucking great match. Um, they had a lot of good matches, and I thoroughly enjoyed this week's show too. I didn't think it was great. It was a step in the right direction, um, but I thought it had a good flow to it. The Money in the Bank stuff is giving more matches, more meaning, which is nice. The women's division is all over the place, but at least they had a handful of matches on the show this week. Um, so yeah, I think that Raw this week was a solid show. But you're right. Why do they see that with fans this stuff clicks, but then they go right back to doing the bad shit? You would think, oh, the fans like this. Let's do more of it. You know, I mean, obviously, sometimes they give us too much of what we want, and they kind of shove it down our throats if we start to catch on to something. Like, if we like a character, for example, they'll take said person and then fucking ruin them by shoving them down our throats. I mean, they do that quite a bit. But in terms of, like, formulaic stuff and, you know, switching up the formula of the show and stuff like that, I don't know. They should stop doing the bad comedy. The shit like the the Alexa Bliss bullshit. That's not even comedy, but like it's just bad television. Why not do less of that garbage and then more of the good stuff? I'm not even saying it has to be all wrestling. Because you said yourself, John, the Kofi and MVP back and forth was not a match. It was a promo. And that was one of the best parts of the show. I liked the Battle Royal stuff. I liked the main event. And I liked the three-way as well. I thought it was great stuff. I, 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 you know, I, I mentioned that twice. The Kofi and MVP as well, or the, the, the back and forth, and then the three-way main event was the main event. So I like the triple threat main event. I like the battle royal, and I like the Kofi and MVP back and forth. I thought that was good enough to make it a solid show. It was enough to make it a solid show. So I don't know. That's that's the ever asked question, dude. Why don't they do more of the good stuff and less of the bad stuff when they are capable of doing the good stuff? I have no idea. Vince McMahon is a very weird man. I think it is safe to say. So any other show would think, oh, you know, the people don't like this. Let's not do it anymore. Nope, they just continue to fucking do it. And it's not even like there's enough people out there who like the bad comedy, who, who like the bad comedy to justify continuing to do it. Like there's a lot of stuff in AEW I don't like, but there's enough people who like it to where they're just going to continue to do it, which it's whatever I might be. In the, I'm definitely in the minority in a lot of this stuff I believe. And I think it's a good show, but that goes with anything. You know, NXT as well, a lot of people have issues with certain ways that they do things, but if enough people like it and enough people don't complain, they're not going to change. I feel like enough people complain about WWE and the ratings reflect it that they're not, or that they should change. They have absolutely no reason to not change if that makes sense. So 
I don't know. But um, yeah, I thought this week's show was solid, and that stuff that you mentioned were the highlights from the show. John's second question, since we're at the halfway point of 2021, what were your, or what would be, your top five favorite and least favorite matches be for this year so far? That's a great question and very timely, considering we are halfway through the year. I was thinking about your question before we went live here, and I'm thinking, I can't sit here and say, like, oh man, this match was like my absolute favorite. Like, I absolutely loved this match. You know, I don't know. I would really have to, I was trying to think of stuff just because a lot of the, there's been so much fucking wrestling that honestly a lot of it has blended together for me. Um, a couple of matches off the top of my head, I could tell you, this is a bit of a random one, but Kaylee Ray and Mako Satamora from NXT UK, both matches were fantastic. They had two excellent matches recently on TV for the NXT UK Women's Championship. I would probably put the first one in that conversation, if not the second one. But both were amazing. For me, W, I really liked, it's not their match of the year, but I really remember liking Cage and Page, um, the Adam Page-Brian Cage match opener from Double or Nothing. Um, what was the other match from that show? Serena Deeb and Riho for the NWA women's title on the pre-show on the buy-in was excellent. The tag team title match I also really, really liked. The Bucks versus Moxley and Kingston I thought was great. The only thing I would probably... The only reason I probably wouldn't put that in my top five is because of the flat finish, but otherwise, I thought it was an amazing match. From the NXT side of things, I thought Ripley and Raquel Gonzalez had a really good last woman standing match in New Year's Evil. Um, Balor and O'Reilly had a good match. It wasn't my top five favorite of the year, but I thought it was good. Um, I don't know if people would say the five-way from TakeOver in your house. I thought that was a great match. I don't think people are going to remember that as being one of the best of the year, but I thought it was great. From the takeovers, what was it, Stand and Deliver? Um, I really, honestly, my one of my favorite matches of the year, and this probably won't be brought up by a lot of people, MSK and Grizzled Young Vets from TakeOver Vengeance Day in the finals of the Men's Dusty Routes Tag Team Classic. That was a great fucking match. That was one of my favorites all year. I thought that was amazing. Um, the Women's Way, that being Candice and Indy, versus Ember and Shotzi, what was it, a... Uh, was it? I think it was a street fight, not a tables match. Someone went through a table, but I'm pretty sure it was a street fight. Uh, for the NXT Women's Tag Team Titles was a great match. Isaiah Swerve, Scott, and Leo Ruff, I think from that same show, Falls Count Anywhere was a great match as well. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed Cole and O'Reilly, the unsanctioned match from Stand and Deliver. I don't know if a lot of people did. I liked it personally. I liked the Balor and Cross matches. Um, bum, bum, bum. I thought Raquel and Io had a really good match on night one. I don't know if I'd put it in the best conversation. From the main roster, I thought the men's rumble was good. I don't know if I would put it the best of the year, but it was a good match. I liked the women's rumble. It was all right. I thought the men's was stronger, but both were good. Um, McIntyre and Lashley have had a lot of good matches. I thoroughly enjoyed Hell in the Cell. I would not put it in my top five because the finish had so much fucking interference. It was so annoying. Um, I would not put it in the top five for that reason, but they have had some good matches. Bianca and Sasha, I would put in that conversation. Great match from night one of WrestleMania. I would put, obviously, the Universal Championship triple threat from night two of WrestleMania. Fucking awesome match. That is definitely, absolutely in the top five. Brian, Edge, and Roman. Great stuff. Um, Roman and Brian from SmackDown from a couple of weeks later and what would turn out to be, for now anyway, Brian's final match with WWE. Awesome match. Um, I thought Roman and Cesaro had a great match of Backlash. I thought the Rollins and Cesaro match from WrestleMania was excellent. Hmm. I'm sure there's more than I'm not, like on TV and stuff. I thought Kofi and Drew had an awesome match on Raw in the main event of Raw a couple of weeks ago. Um, that was fantastic. RK Bro versus The New Day in tag team action a few weeks ago was an excellent match. So there's a handful from WWE. I, I honestly can think of way more from WWE than I can from AEW, just because WWE has way more programming. But in AEW, you know, beyond the ones that I mentioned, I just feel like in AEW, every match is really good, so it's hard to say, like, what the greatest matches are, you know? Um, I really liked, it was on Dynamite, I don't know if I would put it in my top five, but the omega matt Sidell match I thought was really good. Um, they had a really good match. Omega and Moose had a really good match recently in Impact for the Impact World Championship. I liked that. Omega and Rich Swan had a very good match. I don't know if they put my—I I don't know if I'd put that in my top five, but I would for—I I would for Impact though. Um, they had a really, really good match. 
trying to think what else. There's, you know, a couple of... Invex had a lot of really good matches this year. The Under Siege main event, the five-way main event was great. Maybe it was six-way. Either way, it was a really good match. Yeah, for me, AEW, though, I'm stumped. Because I feel like AEW... Oh, I'm a fucking idiot. The Thunder Rosa Britt Baker main event. That was fantastic. That, I think, would be my top five for, honestly, any company. So, my guaranteed top five are that match, Roman, Edge, and Brian, probably Sasha and Bianca, and then... Oh, man, what was the other one that I mentioned? I mean, I mentioned a lot of them. Um, fuck. I'm trying to think. I know there was, like, one match. Oh, shit, like, I'd absolutely put that in there. What did I say? I don't remember, but I definitely think those three would be in my top five. Those were all fantastic matches. Rosa and Baker specifically was really, really fucking good. Man, I'm trying to think. You know, Roman and Owens had a good match at the Rumble, last man standing. That was good. Um, There's probably more I can think of, but I've thoroughly enjoyed a lot of matches this year. Way more than I probably thought I did when I first read your question. Like, oh, I can only name a couple. Then I just named, like, fucking 30, but... They were a lot of good ones. As far as least favorite matches, that's obviously a much shorter list. Anything involving the Alexa Bliss Fiend character has been fucking terrible. And I like Alexa Bliss. And the the dedication that she's shown to the character has been great. The matches themselves have not been good. Like, my least favorite matches, I could tell you three off the top of my fucking head. Alexa Bliss and Shayna from Hell in a Cell was complete garbage. I hated the Fiend-Orton match from WrestleMania. Thought that was just... It was honestly fine, but, like, the finish was terrible, and it was, like, four minutes, and, like, who cares? Um, And then the Damien Priest-Miz Lumberjack match, or should I say a zombie match. The zombie Lumberjack match at Backlash, which fucking sucked. Oh, by the way, speaking of Backlash, I really enjoyed Lashley, McIntyre, and Strowman in that three-way for the WWE title. That might be in my favorite matches, to be honest with you. I thought that was really, really fucking good. But, um... Yeah, no, I thought all those matches were uh, good, except for the three I just mentioned, which were fucking terrible. For me, W, like, least favorite matches. There's not a lot of matches that are, like, my least favorite. I remember not liking, what was it, Omega and the Good Brothers versus Moxley and the Bucks. The Bucks acting at that point, it, it still sucks, but, like, the Bucks were like, oh, I can't hit Kenny, and it's gonna, like, he, they started crying, and Matt Jackson started crying. It was fucking stupid. So bad. So I'd probably, I mean, the match wasn't terrible, but like the acting was atrocious. It was really bad. So I'd probably put that in the conversation as well. In terms of like poorly wrestled matches, um, maybe Cody and Anthony Agogo was just fucking bizarre. Anything involving QT Marshall, I just think is terrible. Um, I fucking hate QT Marshall. I'm not an Abaddon fan. I know you are, John. She's not really on the show as much, so I can't really say anything involving her because she's barely on Dynamite anymore. She hasn't been in like six months. I'm not a big Abaddon fan at all, but um, yeah, I don't know. I think that's about it. Um, if I think of anything else, I'll probably, <laughs> I'll mention it on a future episode, but <clears throat> yeah, thankfully 2021 has featured a lot more great matches than it has bad, so there is there is something to be said for that, which is nice. His third question, I know you watch and review Impact Wrestling regularly, so I want to ask, do you think there's anything the company can do to drum up more interest, or are they pretty much stuck at their current level for good? You know, honestly, I hate to say this, but I really do think it's the latter. I really do think that they are stuck at whatever level. It's not the worst place to be. They're still in business. They're still putting out shows. They're on Access TV. They're not only on Twitch anymore and the fucking Pursuit channel or whatever the hell it was called, the Haunting channel. They're in a better spot than they were a year or two ago. So it's not to say that they can't grow, but in terms of their fan base and people coming back and watching the show on the regular, you know, I'm going to say this. I honestly think Impact is one of the better weekly shows that I've seen in wrestling all year. It really is. I thoroughly enjoy the show. It's logical booking. They have good matches. Um, It's kind of like NXT where they, they have a lot of good stuff, but there's just not enough people talking about it. It just doesn't have that buzz. The problem with Impact, though, Impact or NXT had that buzz like a year or two ago. Impact has not had that buzz in close to 10 fucking years. So at this point, with NXT, but people will fall back in NXT or they could if they wanted to. With Impact, honestly, I have not seen a lot of people say, you know what, I used to fucking hate Impact, it was trash, but then they really turned me around with all the good work they've been doing recently. I haven't seen that any, I haven't seen any of that at all. The problem is that they do a lot of good stuff and people will pay attention or talk about it like, oh, I saw the Omega-Rich Swan match, but they won't stick around. 
because they are so burned on the impact, TNA, GFW bullshit that they're just never going to revert back. They're goners. Honestly, it's like the whole WCW thing. Like, WWE for so long tried to get back those WCW fans that never translated over to WWE when they bought them out in 01. Um, You know, they tried. They really, really tried to get those fans back, and they probably got some of them back with certain stuff they did, like when they brought in Sting and when they first brought back Goldberg, but they didn't stick around. I have never seen anyone say, oh, you know, I used to watch WCW, and then when they brought back Sting and Goldberg, I became a fan again. Maybe a few people, definitely not an overwhelming majority. People just stop watching and they never go back. Especially if the like the bad taste that the company gives you lasts for so like there's a lot of people who stop watching WWE and will probably never go back to it because of the bad taste it gave them for so long. Like the damage has been done. You can't go back. You can, you know, be like, listen, it's good, they're doing good stuff and whatever. But I'm just, I'm done. Honestly, it's like, it's like a relationship or something like that. It's like you have enough problems with your significant other, whether it be a girlfriend or a boyfriend or a wife or a husband or whatever. And there's enough problems to where you're like, all right, I got to, I got to sever this relationship. Like this is, it's toxic. I, I love this person, but at the same time, it's like they're causing me way more pain than happiness, that being WWE, or I mean, I, I know I'm taking your question to the next level here, but just let me finish. It's like, listen, this this whether this product or this person has caused so much toxicity, I've got to I've got to sever the relationship, and it could be years. You could see that person again. You could stop by. You can run into them on the street. You can catch WWE on a channel while you're channel surfing. Uh, uh, you can catch WWE on USA while you're channel surfing. And be like, you know what? They're doing some pretty good stuff now. Those bad memories will forever be there. And yes, there is something to be said about moving, about moving on, but the damage has been done. Enough damage has been done that to go back to it, you just can't bring yourself to do it. And it's just fucking stupid. You would be an idiot to go back after all the negative shit that has been done. No matter how much you may love it or used to love it. And impact is no different. I know that's a that might be an awful analogy, but that's what it feels like to me where a lot of people were like, listen, I used to love impact, but it's fallen so far off the radar for so long, no matter how good it is now, I just don't care anymore. You know, it's not even to a point where you still love the thing or you still love to hate it. You just don't give a shit. People just don't care about impact overall. And it's a shame because I honestly really enjoy the product. They bring in a lot of people and they have a very good roster. They just don't have the star power, the same star power they did a couple of years ago even. So it's like people, like when Styles left, that was a real big nail in the coffin for a lot of people because he was a big reason as to why people watched. And he wasn't even a former WWE guy. I mean, he's in WWE now, but he was a guy that people would watch for. Samoa Joe was a guy that people would watch for. Sting, Kurt Angle, and they're all gone. Maybe not Hulk Hogan, but like people, they, they had notable names that people could tune in to see what they're doing. They don't really have any of that now. Eddie Edwards is not that guy. Rich Swan is not that guy. They have Omega there from AEW, but he's on loan. And, and uh, I love Impact, but that's just what it is. So I honestly do not see them getting too far above their current level. They could always go to a better station. They could always get some boosts in viewership and the occasional good buy rate for their pay-per-views. But beyond that, though, I think they're stuck at their current level for good because the damage has been done. And even with the reset, because they, you know, they moved over to Impact or not TNA anymore, that shift happened so much later than it should have, it just doesn't even matter. They will always be known as TNA. If they made the switch over in 2011 like they were trying to when they were calling it Impact Wrestling on the regular, and at the end of the day, though, it was still fucking TNA. It was still LOL TNA. If they made the switch 10 years ago, they probably would be in a better spot than they are now. But they're just, they're not. Like, they made the switch way too late. It was it was too little too late. So I wish them all the best. I enjoy Impact a lot, but they are probably stuck at their current level for good, I hate to say. At Iwagu91 from Twitter, did you know that Bobby Lashley versus Xavier Woods is the first Hell in a Cell match that featured solely black competitors in the match? I did not know that. That is a good stat and a sad stat because I feel like in the 25 years of Hell in a Cell, nearly 25 years since 1997, we've never had another Cell match that featured only black competitors. That's 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 terrible that that we haven't had that before now. But that also just goes to show a bigger overall issue in WWE 
and I listen. I know people are gonna be like, oh, the new day and Bianca and Sasha, like they're pushing. They're it's not like. Listen, I'm not saying they don't push any people of color, but it is far so little than what it should be. Like Isaiah Swerve Scott won the North American Championship last night. That's awesome. He should have. Like I think he's awesome. But the problem is that it's happening now. This should have happened ten fucking years ago. They had almost no black people on top in their company for a long fucking time. Like, listen, I think it's awesome that Bobby Lashley is the, is the third black WWE champion they've had, second to Kofi Kingston. But before Kofi, they only had The Rock. The title's been around for 50 fucking years, and it's not even like... Obviously, you shouldn't just push people for like, oh, we got to push this person to push this agenda just to have a person of color on top. There's been a lot of people that, are, that were worthy of that spot, even Bobby years ago, and they waited until 2021 to do it. Kofi could have been at that spot years ago, but they just didn't want to. MVP was always great. I mean, you can go down the long list of people that could have been pushed, that could have been bigger deals, and they just fizzled out for whatever reason. But holy shit, man. I mean, it's it's crazy. Listen, I think it's great that Lashley's the WWE champion. This should happen fucking years ago. They, they, they should be commended to a certain respect, but it's like, where was this 10 years ago? I know that wasn't your question, and it just got me thinking about it. I'm like... Why isn't it a more normal thing? Like, with the women, it's become normal for them to, like, headline pay-per-views and headline Raws and SmackDowns. That's great that it's normal now. It should have been normal 10, 15 years ago. But, again, better late than never, I guess. But we need to get that way with this type of stuff. Again, don't just put two black guys in there just to say, oh, yeah, you're the first ever black versus black person, hell in a cell main event, whatever. Obviously, don't do it just for that reason. But, like, there are reasons to do... Like, you know, Sasha and Bailey or Sasha and Bianca could be a Hell in the Cell match at some point. That makes sense to do inside the cell. But we should have been to this spot a long time ago. A long time ago. Like, it's really sad that it took this long. But, again, that's WWE for you. Um, at ULG91, there's a second question. Do you think that Big E will be drafted to Raw to reunite with Kofi Kingston and Xavier Woods? Uh, do I think he will? There's a very good chance, per the reports from at WrestleVotes, who's a very good WWE insider source, who I credit here often here on the show. Um, he had said that Big E was reportedly, they were thinking about moving him to Raw to reunite with New Day, even though while doing the singles thing. I don't care if he's still doing the singles thing. Keep him away from Kofi and Woods. Because if you put them on the same show, then it's an excuse to do the, uh, oh, the six-man tag team match. We don't need the fucking New Day six-man tags. We've got that for seven years. We don't need it anymore. We don't need it right now. I'm not saying they can't do it at all anymore, but, like, for right now, Biggie has got to grow on his own. Team with other people. Do his own thing. Even if he is in the single ranks, so even if he is in the single ranks over on Raw, they will still be tempted to do stuff with the New Day. I guarantee fucking to it as a unit. So just avoid that issue altogether by keeping him on SmackDown. He's perfect on SmackDown. I want the Big E Roman match at some point, please. Listen, I know Raw needs the top baby faces, but the thing is, so does SmackDown. So again, please keep it. He's the one guy on SmackDown, the one baby face that Roman has not beaten yet. So please keep him on Friday nights. At Iwagu91's next question, Will, um, or do you think that Johnny Gargano will challenge Karrion Cross for the NXT title? <clears throat> I don't know if it's going to be for the championship. I know they furthered the feud last night um, on NXT. They had their segment last week where Cross attacked him on the show. Obviously, they're building towards a match between the two. Maybe they'll add it. Maybe they did add it to next week's show. I, I don't think they did. I could be wrong. I don't think they did. But assuming it is added to next week's show or they add it to next week's show or the week after that or TakeOver or whatever, if it's at TakeOver, it's probably going to be for the championship. If you do it on the weekly show, would it be for the title? It doesn't have to be. It is very possible that Johnny will be carrying for that championship, and I don't know how to feel about that right now. And I love Johnny. I'm just, I just don't love that idea. But yes, I do think we're getting Gargano and Cross at some point soon. Would it be for the championship though? It probably will be. I don't know how you justify that. Johnny has he lost his North American title. He lost in the... He already failed to win the fucking NXT title at uh, TakeOver in your house. He wasn't pinned, but he already failed to win the championship there. So, like, why would he get another title shot? Unless He needs to beat a couple people first. I know he and Austin Theory beat Pete Dunn and um, <clears throat> Oni Lorcan in tag team match last week. In, in tag team action last week, but, like, you gotta have him pick up at least one more win, a number one contenders win, or something. 
in order to justify him getting a title shot. But it, it's WWE. I'm sure they won't. His last question, what are your thoughts on Kofi Kingston being in the WWE title picture once again? I think it's great. Um, I'm happy to see it. It makes sense because, you know, I mean, first of all, Kofi's win over Lashley was indeed fluky. But fluky or not, he is one of two people, or three people, I guess, to have pinned Lashley this year. And we're almost, the year's halfway over, so like that's saying something. The other two people being Riddle, one-on-one back in January, and Drew pinned him in the six-man tag team match recently on uh, on Raw, right before Hell in a Cell. And that's it, I'm pretty sure, unless I'm missing somebody. But I'm pretty sure that's it. So he's only lost a singles match or two, <clears throat> including the Kofi on Raw. It was a fluky finish, but I'm glad they're going back to it. They haven't really done Kofi and Lashley a lot. It's not you know a, a match we've seen a million times before, maybe only that one time on Raw. And that's it. That's it. So I'm glad they're going back to it. It's a cool spot for Kofi to be in. He's doing great work right now, him and Woods both. Um, It's cool to see them branching off and doing singles stuff for right now because that's really what they should be doing with them. I do not want to see them go back after the Raw Tag Team titles. Been there, done that. I'm done with that shit. Um, Doing this type of stuff I think is great. So yeah, I think it's cool. Will he win? No. But it will be cool to see him um, back in the title picture once again and uh, and, and what should be a good match with Lashley at the pay-per-view. At the average grunt from Twitter, what pay-per-views do you regret missing? Whether you couldn't afford to order them or you had something else going on that day. My answers are Backlash 04, SummerSlam 04, and WrestleMania 22. That's a great question. Um, I was thinking about this before we started recording. I'm thinking about it. <clears throat> I'm thinking about it now. I can't think of one obvious answer, to be honest with you. For example, I didn't order Money in the Bank 2011. I watched it some other way. Let's just put it that way, live. Um, So it's not a regret. I I don't regret missing that pay-per-view because I didn't miss it. I watched it live. It probably would be that show, to be honest. Um, Just because I I wasn't there, I didn't order it. So you would think that show, because it's one of my favorite pay-per-views of all time. But I did watch it live, so I can't say that. I watched all the pay-per-views live. Like, I started watching wrestling in 2008, which a lot of people still can't believe, but whatever. Um, And people, like, judge you for that. Like, who fucking cares? It's wrestling, you know? But, like, from that point up until 2010, I didn't watch any of the pay-per-views. And there were a lot of good pay-per-views. Like, I wanted to keep up with Hell... Not Hell in a Cell. What was it? SummerSlam 08. I really, really liked that show. Watching it back now... I didn't watch the show. I wasn't even around when the show happened. I think I was, like, at the beach or something with my family. So, like, I got... WWE was doing, like, this mobile thing at the time where, like, they would text you updates with results from their shows. So they texted me updates um, with results from SummerSlam. And that's how I found out who won each match and shit like that, so... And I would also look on Wikipedia to see who won, and I, I couldn't see any highlights from the show. I wish I could have watched that live. I've watched all the WrestleManias live for the most part. Um, WrestleMania, that would probably be my answer. WrestleMania 25 would probably be the pay-per-view I regret not watching, only because I could have. That was the only pay-per-view in the time that I've been a fan that I did not either, I did not watch with someone that ordered it, order it myself, or attend. So, like, 2010, I watched at someone's house, 2011, 2012, WrestleMania, like, every WrestleMania, for the most part, I went over to someone's house, watched it in my dorm, or was there. With that first Mania that I was a fan for, WrestleMania 25 and 09, I was invited over to a friend's house at the time and to watch WrestleMania, and I was planning on going. Literally, maybe a week before the show, a week or two before the show, had a terrible report card. I was in eighth grade at the time. And my mom, I never even asked her if I could go, but I knew the answer would be no. I was grounded at the time, essentially. It just, I just knew it wasn't going to happen. So I'm like, fuck. So I couldn't watch the show. Obviously, WrestleMania 25 was not my favorite WrestleMania at all, but it did feature one of the greatest matches of all time, which I did end up watching in full when I got the WrestleMania 25 DVD as a birthday gift a few months later. But I did not get to watch WrestleMania 25 live, even though I could have. I had the option to, and just I couldn't because my fucking grades, I, I, you know, I was not doing well at the time academically. So instead, I went to the WWE Universe chat, that's what they called it at the time, it was like their version of like Facebook or whatever, 
And they had a live chat for all the pay-per-views with uh, their social media manager at the time, Corey Clayton, I think their name was, and Howard Finkel would be in the chat too in addition to like various other special guests. So like I was live in the chat for the show and I was like, oh man, like they were telling everyone like, oh yeah, he just kicked out of the tombstone and he just kicked out of the Sweet Chin Music. I'm like, holy fuck, this match sounds amazing. And I couldn't watch it live. I just got live updates from these people. And I was so pissed. I'm like, man, I wish I could have seen this match. So probably WrestleMania 25. Almost every other pay-per-view in the last 10 years, there hasn't been that amazing of a pay-per-view where I'm like, fuck, I really wish I watched that live. Like Evolution, I didn't watch live and I, I could have gone to it too. And it was a great show. I don't sit here saying I regret not going. The build was so bad to Evolution, um, the women's pay-per-view. The build was terrible. So it's not even like, ah, oh, am I on the fence? I was just like, no, I'm not going. And the show ended up being great. So, you know, that's cool. But, like, I don't regret not going, even though the show was really, really good. So, yeah, like I said, every other pay-per-view in, like, the last 10, 13 years that I've been watching wrestling, I either couldn't have watched anyway... Or if I had something else going on, like I was working, or I had another event, or I was on vacation, or whatever, which happened quite a bit. That's happened a lot in recent years, where like I'll have a like I made it the point for years to watch all the pay per views live. Like I never missed a pay per view from probably 2010 through 2013. Battleground 2013 comes around. The product was so bad at the time, and I'm like, you could say what you will about the product now. It is better than it was at this point. It was fucking terrible. And this was around the time that the authorities started up and shit. So I was watching the product at the time and Battleground was on. The first ever Battleground pay-per-view they did. And like, I think I had parents over at my school that weekend. I was in college. I was a freshman. It was like parents weekend or something. And I had a homework to do. That did not stop me from... Homework had never stopped me before from watching a WWE pay-per-view. I could name you probably 10 different instances of when I had homework through the next day, but I would say, fuck it, I'm watching the pay-per-view instead. Book reports, it doesn't matter. I never... I did all that shit when I had the chance, but, like, wrestling always came first for me. In college, I'm like, listen, this is stupid homework I could just do afterward, but I'm like, I just don't give a fuck about this pay-per-view. I'm going to just watch it tomorrow. Fuck it. I'm not going to watch it now. <laughs> so I did, and that was the first pay-per-view I missed in like three years. And I don't regret it at all because that show sucked, aside from the Cody Rhodes and uh, Dustin Rhodes, the Gold Dust versus Shield match. But yeah, um, I do regret... I, I didn't really have an option, but um, in 2017... I'm going, I'm rambling here, so I apologize, but this is a great question. The only show I wish I had attended, I, I missed a live event where The Rock was at in Boston. I had tickets to it. I, I traded them in for a refund because I, I was on vacation anyway. The Rock showed up, which is fucking awesome. It was in Boston like six years ago, almost exactly six years ago, actually. Um, I went to an awesome Raw seven years ago today in Hartford where Jericho came back and then The Miz came back and the Wyatt family attacked Jericho, all this other shit. But the one show that I really wish I had gone to in recent years that I probably could have, but my priorities were correct in this respect at the time. So I'm not even saying, oh, in retrospect, I wish I went to the show because I would have been a terrible person. But my girlfriend at the time uh, wanted me to go visit her like halfway across the country the weekend of SummerSlam in 2017. I went to SummerSlam weekend in 2015 and 2016. 2017, I did not go. SummerSlam, I don't regret attending. I don't I don't regret not going to because the show was not good. It was just a terrible pay-per-view. One of the worst SummerSlams I've seen in recent years. TakeOver, however, was fucking amazing. I was there for Brooklyn's... take. I was there for every TakeOver in the Barclays Center, all five of them, except for that third one. I was there for one, two, four in what they called New York in 2019. Um, I did not go to that third one because they went to go visit my... <coughs> excuse me, my girlfriend at the time, halfway across the country, that same fucking weekend. And it was like one of the best takeovers they did. They had Andrade versus Johnny Gargano, amazing match. Aleister Black versus Hideo Itami, amazing match. Even Sanity versus Authors of Pain was a great fucking match. Ember Moon and Asuka, amazing match. Drew and Bobby, rude, not a great match, but, you know, it was it was decent. T McIntyre wins the title, Undisputed Era debuts. I'm like, what the fuck? I mean, this is amazing. So it was just crazy. But uh, that was an amazing show. I was so fucking pissed I couldn't be there for that. 
Again, I don't regret it in retrospect. I would have been a terrible person um, had I gone to that, <laughs> had I chose to go to that show except for going to visit my girlfriend at the time, even though in, in my opinion now it's not that worth, it, you know, I'm not with them anymore. I would be like, oh, I'd go to the show any day of the week. But like that would have been a bad thing for me to do. That would be a bad boyfriend thing for me to do at the time. So I apologize for rambling, but that was a really good question. So anyway, on to the last one. Have you heard about, I'm sorry, this is from at E13A. So thank you, Emmanuel. His question was, have you heard about the WWE writer, Kenneth Mobley, who recently got fired, apparently, for admitting in a podcast, admitting in a podcast, that she didn't need to be familiar with WWE? Yes, I heard about it. Um, after going so long with the last question, I'll try not to ramble as much with this one. We're, all, we're over 45 minutes in now, and <laughs> the funny thing is that we only, we don't have a ton of questions this week, but it went so long with a lot of them, that's why we're going so long here, but whatever. Um... So, with this situation, I have not yet spoken about this just because I thought the whole thing was so stupid in terms of people overreacting to this in that she did not get fired for saying that she wasn't familiar with WWE. I don't work there. I don't know her. I don't have the inside sources that all these other people do. But I could tell you right now, I don't, I severely doubt that she was fired for saying, oh yeah, they hired me without even knowing anything about wrestling. There have been a lot of people who have said, you do not need to know anything about WWE. It's on their fucking Indeed page. You do not need to know anything about WWE in order to use, you know, in order to, you know, excel at this position. It says it on their own fucking website. She did not get fired for saying that. She got fired. If you read the whole transcript, and I even listened to the audio to hear how she sounded, she clearly does not give a fuck about professional wrestling. But that's fine. But what she said, first of all, doing a podcast about your new position and a new job, it's not exactly this local fucking pharmacy that you're working at. You're not working at Dunkin' Donuts. If you're working at Apple, the people, the head honcho, or if you're working for Amazon, fucking Jeff Bezos is not going to jump on the podcast and hear what you're saying bad about Amazon. I, I severely doubt it. With WWE, though, they're a much smaller company. They're a big company, but they're a smaller company, and their fans catch everything. So if you're on a podcast talking about, oh, I just got hired by them, this is what they're paying me, blah, 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 blah. this is what I'm going to be doing, they will not fucking miss it. WWE might slip through their fingers, but it will not slip through the fingers of fans. People are on this shit. So essentially, it was the fans drawing attention to the podcast that got her fired. But everyone is at fault here. So here are my thoughts on everything. Everyone is stupid in this situation. This woman, Kenneth Mobley, was not fired for not knowing anything about WWE. Whatever. I'll have more thoughts on that in a second about the fact that she didn't watch the product. She probably shouldn't have said, oh, I don't even know the name of their top champion, Bobby Ashley, Bobby Lashley, what is it? She probably shouldn't have said that. What I think really did her in, if you read the transcript of what she said and you listen to the podcast, it was at the end when the guy was like, oh, or no, no, she shared a story. Because the guy that she did the podcast with, just not, she, he thought it was a joke. Like, oh man, that's, that's funny that you're working for WWE. Like, I thought it was the WWF. Like, the guy was clearly making a joke about it. And she, you could tell that she felt embarrassed that she even was working there. But she told this quick story about how she was on a date and the guy asked her, Oh, do you feel like your integrity, like you've lost your integrity now that you're writing or working for WWE? And she didn't say no. She didn't say no. She was like fucking, oh, you know, like I've been doing this for eight years, so I might as well give it a shot. And it's paying three times as much as my last job. So why not give it a shot? It's like, dude, even if you feel that way, like I'm sure there's a lot of people who work for that company who are only doing it for the money or because they're good at whatever they do, not because they like wrestling. Not everyone who works there has to grow up like you or me or whoever knowing who Macho Man Randy Savage is or knowing who Bobby Lashley is or knowing who CM Punk is. It would help, and it honestly should be a requirement, which I'll get to in a second, but her biggest issue was saying something so dumb Like, why would you be so transparent on a fucking podcast? And obviously, she underestimated the professional wrestling world. It was on a podcast that clearly no one listens to. Um, I don't even remember what it was called. It wasn't like Joe Rogan or something. It was some stupid... Like, it's like anyone... It's me having a podcast, you having a podcast. Like, I'm not saying our shows are small. But you know what I'm saying? Like, It's a much smaller scale than it being on, like, ESPN.com. It was any... Like, if it was on my show... 
whatever. I'm sure no one would have heard it. You know what I'm saying? Like if it was like WWE, WWE is not listening to hashtag ask GSM. People are not listening to any Marks podcast, unless it's a major podcast that gets traction because people listen to it and catch the quotes and share it and blah, blah, blah. That's what happened. So I don't know if she shared the interview or just the fan heard it by coincidence and shared it, whatever. The fan's reaction to this shit, I mean, she was stupid for saying what she did. That was really dumb. That's what got her fired. That's what happened before she even started. The, before we get to the fans, WWE is at fault in this. Not really for firing her because she said something really dumb because you can't have employees doing that. That sets a bad precedent for like, oh, let's go on the air and talk about what our positions entail. Like, that's really dumb. You can't be doing that. They're at fault here for, not for that shit, but for hiring people, a lot of people, um, that don't have wrestling experience. Like, she didn't have to have any wrestling experience at all. Not even experience, but like knowledge. Product knowledge. Like, before you hire someone, and she said that she was sitting down the next day to watch Raw or something, so she was at least attempting to get familiar with the product. But, like, even if you've never seen a day of wrestling in your life, when they hire these people, they gotta be like, all right, you gotta fucking sit down and watch Raw and SmackDown next week or for the next two weeks and tell me everything that you thought happened. If they pass, then you're hired, in addition to all the other necessary skill sets and whatever. That's their problem. It's not a big problem. But the thing is, I've spoken to people in the company before, specifically people from the writing team um, and people that were on the writing team, people that tried out for the writing team. I've spoken to a lot of people in and out of the company about this stuff. They do have people on the teams that aren't wrestling related. Oh my God, what a shock. Like, I mean, obviously that's not really a surprise. But my point is, is that I was told at one point that they have, like this was about a year and a half ago, they had horror writers on SmackDown for the Fiend stuff. They had comedy writers on SmackDown for the Otis stuff. I might be way off here, but do you think they had a wrestling genius book that Otis storyline? Like the woman that was responsible for that Otis storyline got fired last year. Do you think she grew up watching wrestling? Do you think that she has been working there for a decade and has come up with all these great wrestling ideas, I'm going to go off on a limb and say no. I mean, she she came up with a great idea, but it wasn't like this typical wrestling storyline. It was just a really good comedy storyline that just so happened to work within the confines of WWE because she's a good writer. The girl that they fired, Kenneth Mobley, was a comedy writer. If she can go in there and help with the verbiage, which is what she said that she was going to do, she was going to go in there, help with the verbiage help with what their people are saying, because what they're scripted to say on these shows is fucking terrible. If she could help with that and help with what John mentioned earlier, the bad comedy, that's her job. Like, that I think is great. She doesn't have to, she's not in there booking McIntyre versus Bobby Lashley as a match, coming up with the fucking finish. What her job is, as far as I'm aware, or would have been, would be coming up with what these people are saying, how they're acting, and the general basic necessities of a storyline that a lot of these storylines in WWE for whatever reason are lacking. Hopefully she would help with the Riddle Orton stuff, which has been very entertaining and, you know, do that type of thing. You don't have to have a wrestling degree, a bachelor's degree in wrestling in order to write for some of these shows. But I think that's what some of these shows need. They need outside writers to work on the creative team or work on the verbiage and bring a fresh perspective to it. But it's got to be a healthy balance with WWE. It can't be all people who have never seen wrestling before. That's part of the problem. You have to have people on your creative team. And I don't work there. I don't know anyone that, I don't know everyone that works on the team. And they do have a bunch of people, like, obviously Bruce Pritchard is a wrestling guy. For as much shit as people want to give him, he's a wrestling guy. Maybe out of touch, but he's a wrestling guy. You need a healthy mix of people like that and a healthy mix of people that aren't familiar with wrestling, but they're good with horror and comedy and you know, serious drama, stuff like that, you know? So I think it's a good mix. Um, Currently, they don't require any wrestling knowledge whatsoever to work for them. That is part of the problem with them. The fans are at fault here. I mean, them dragging up the quotes and talking about it probably was what got her fired because I'm sure they would not have even heard about this had fans not made light of it. But the fans over-fucking-reacting over people like, oh, we don't want her here, you know, blah, blah, blah. Holy shit, it was embarrassing. People's reactions to this was ridiculous. I laughed off the fact that she called him Bobby Ashley. That was a little stupid. 
But like everyone else saying, oh, you know, this this company, it's the last thing they need is more people like this. And the WWE needs people like this woman. Without saying the dumb stuff, what she said on the podcast, but like her skill set is what this company needs more of in addition to the wrestling people they already have. Like I said, healthy balance. It needs to be 50-50 or at least 60-40, something along those lines. We need a wrestling perspective on these shows and an outside perspective for drama, comedy, horror, stuff like that. The horror shit with Alexa Bliss, I don't know who the fuck is writing it, but it's terrible. Whoever's writing the Orton Riddle stuff, the comedy stuff with them is great. So they need to hire people who have a strength in each of those divisions and whatever, and then go from there. It's just, I don't know. I think fans were overreacting like, oh man, you know, fuck this person. And oh my God, the people, just the embarrassing shit from some of the fan base is just embarrassing because it makes everyone look terrible. It makes all fans look terrible when you have that negative, I don't know if it's majority, but that negative contingent of fans are so vocal and just nasty, oh my god, like wishing death upon this woman, hoping she gets fired, which she did, but not for the reasons that we all think, it's not like, oh, she's not a wrestling person, so let's get her the fuck out of here, like, that's not why they fired her, people are like, oh yeah, they fired her, because, you know, we made a big complaint about it, no, they fired her, because of what she said at the end there, about kind of being ashamed to work there, that is part of the problem with her, the fans' problem are freaking the fuck out about not having a wrestling person on the creative team, or, like, I mean, there are people on the creative team that are wrestling, you know, minded and stuff. But, like, them hiring a comedy writer. Holy shit. Stop freaking the fuck out. Like, give her a shot. Oh, my God. Like, just give it a chance. Like, I understand where people are coming from. But you have to realize that wrestling is not everything with these shows. There are other aspects of the shows that aren't wrestling. Raw is bad. So hopefully she could help with the comedy and made some of the scriptage, you know, made some of the verbiage better and the promos better. We'll never know because she got canned. But this shit happens all the time and you never hear anyone talk about it because they don't fucking go on podcasts talking about it. So we're, I don't know. The fans are at fault. The company's at fault. The woman's at fault. Those are my extensive thoughts on the whole situation. It was just one giant dumb situation that could have been easily avoided had she not said anything stupid on the podcast like she did, had fans not freaked out, and had WWE just hired people that have more knowledge or have more, like, inclined them to watch the product more than they do. To not know a single lick about wrestling is is an issue. Um, you have to have some knowledge of it. You don't have to be a diehard fan. But that was their problem as well. So that was, I, I say my two cents, that was a whole, like, $10 on the situation. But, uh... Yeah, that, 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 that's, I was, I was going to say that's it in a nutshell, but that was quite the extensive explanation. And we're almost an hour in here after answering like 10 questions. So <laughs> that's it for today's episode, guys. I love answering your questions. Uh, you guys sent in a lot of good ones this week, a lot of uh, in-depth ones I could really sink my teeth into. So thank you. I talk a lot, obviously. I ramble a lot. So I appreciate any great questions you guys can send my way. Uh, be sure to tweet any questions that you have for me on the Twitter machine at WrestleRam with the hashtag AskGSM. Find me on Facebook as well at facebook.com backslash graham.gsm.matthews. Drop a comment on the post that I usually put up on Tuesday nights, if not on the wall itself. Last but certainly not least, drop your question down below in the comment section on this very video. I'll include your question in next week's edition. So have an awesome one, guys. Like I said earlier, check out my latest exclusive interviews with Frankie Monet from last week. Tommaso Ciampa from this week, Devontae Adams from last week, and more to come in the days to come. So if you haven't already, please like this video, drop a comment, share the video, and subscribe to the channel for more daily content and exclusive interviews you're not going to hear anywhere else. Have an awesome one, guys. I'm Graham G.S. and Matthews, and I'll catch your ass down the road.